Welcome to Magna Carta 2022. The Magna Carta is basically a crash course for the subject of polity for the upcoming Civil Services 2022 preliminary exam. We are on lecture number 6.2 wherein we are going to be studying the legislatures. And we are going to be studying central and state legislatures simultaneously and comparatively. There are a few things that have to be kept in mind before we undertake our study of the legislatures. Number one, most of the standard textbooks, when they deliver legislatures to you, they combine constitutional provisions and provisions which are mentioned in the respective rules of procedure of the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Now, as far as the prelims is concerned, it has been carefully observed that at least in the last 10 years, not a single question has been asked from the rules of procedure of the Lok Sabha or the Rajya Sabha. Which means, we should primarily focus on the constitutional provisions with respect to the legislatures. Which also brings me to the second point. Especially in legislatures, there are a lot of grey areas which arise out of circumstances, which arise out of certain situations, whether they could be political or not. Now, the civil services exam, especially in the prelims part, will never ask you a question of law which is legally ambiguous which means they will never ask you a question which is not categorically mentioned in the law or can be very clearly derived from the law. So a lot of these grey areas where the constitution remains silent which we will broadly cover in the course of the lecture should be completely avoided. Third. When we study central legislatures and state legislatures, 80% of our focus should be on central legislatures, which is the parliament. Because a majority of the questions are going to come from here. As far as state legislatures are concerned, just a broad composition and a broad comparison respectively is all that is needed. Like I had mentioned at the beginning of lecture 6.1, it is excruciatingly important for you to be very well aware with certain concepts that I have taught you in lecture number 1.2. The concepts pertaining to the four golden rules, the majorities and the applications of those majorities. Because they would be used left, right and centre for us to understand legislatures. In fact, in my view, it is this topic which is the most logical part of the constitution and does not require any memorization, in my honest opinion. Now, this lecture on legislatures has been fundamentally divided into five parts and we're going to follow a broad, narrow, broad format. We'll begin with the houses narrow down to the members of the houses, further narrow down to the presiding officers, then take a step back, understand the procedures for these houses and herein we'll focus only on the central legislatures, not the state, leg uh, not the state legislatures and then we'll also understand parliamentary committees. These are your five dominant areas which are more than enough for you to get your questions in the prelims right. Then of course, We'll close the lecture on the reading list. Let's begin. When a basic question is asked, what comprises of the parliament? The answer is, the parliament comprises of the president, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. This does not mean that the president is a member of parliament. This means that the president is a part of the parliament and why is that the case? It's because of a simple application of rule number four which is checks and balances. 
as we had understood in lecture number 6.1 that the president after being elected by law is supposed to be apolitical cannot have any formal association with any political party whatsoever as far as the lok sabha and the rajya sabha is concerned while both of them are representatives of some people in some form they are political outfits while lok sabha is the political epicenter of the country is the political hot spot of the country it is the majority in the lok sabha which allows for the government to be formed which governs the entirety of this country at the end of the day the lok sabha is a political house which means they will always want to be in the pursuit of ensuring that their majority remains intact they enjoy the confidence of the people and for that reason they may sometimes resort to populism they may sometimes look at passing legislations which may not necessarily be in the best interest of the country but are in the best interest of continuing and ensuring their political majority similarly while the rajya sabha does not play a formative role in the determination of political majority at the center in fact rajya sabha does not have any concept of an absolute majority or a political majority it is still a political house it has been elected by the elected mlas from the states it is supposed to represent the will of the states which are also political houses and it could be the case that the rajya sabha may unnecessarily play an obstructionist role it could also be the case that the rajya sabha may not provide the constructive criticism that is needed and as a measure of the last resort you would then require the president to have a say in the conduct of the parliament and of course with respect to legislative businesses this is why the president is a part of the parliament the prelims exam is not going to ask you identify the most appropriate reason as to why the president is a part of the parliament but it may definitely ask you an option which says the president is in fact a part of the parliament similarly at the level of the states the governor is a member is is not a member of the state legislatures but is certainly a part of the state legislatures now here we will apply rule number 2 which is center stronger than the states unlike the president who by law is supposed to be a political there is no such dedicated provision for the governor in fact the governor is an appointed authority by the president on the binding advice of the council of ministers still is a distinct authority from the legislatures the governor or the appointment of the governor formally by law has nothing to do with the legislatures by convention you may consult the chief minister but the governor is fundamentally appointed by the president on the advice of the council of ministers right so the same function is actually performed by the governor but the governor does not have the same kind of hardened independence like possibly the president would because the governor serves at the distinct pleasure of the president and the governor could of course be removed in a far easier manner than the president nonetheless the governor still is distinct from the legislatures this is why the president and the governor respectively are parts of the parliament and the state legislatures but not members and they can never be members now this is the first and the most simple understanding now these houses will have presiding officers who will govern these houses 
and these houses largely comprise of the members. Now, let's take a deeper look at the houses. We're essentially going to be looking at all the four together, the Lok Sabha, the Rajya Sabha, the Assemblies and the Legislative Councils. As you can see, the Lok Sabha and the State Legislative Assemblies are versions of each other. The State Legislative Assembly is nothing but a regional version of the Lok Sabha. So you will find a lot of similarities. In the same way, the Rajya Sabha's regional version is a Legislative Council. But the difference is, a Legislative Assembly is far more similar to a Lok Sabha than the Council with respect to the Rajya Sabha. The Rajya Sabha has greater powers as the second house as compared to the Council as the second house of the states. It would be appropriate to say that the second house or the upper house of the center compared to the upper house of the states are not equally positioned. They do not have the same status and they do not have the same power. Now, let's look at certain criteria. We're going to understand a status, the composition, the process of election, with some information on the strength, we will look at residency requirements and of course we'll understand who is actually represented. Let's start with the Lok Sabha. So we'll do it comparatively. We'll do the Lok Sabha and the Assembly together. Then we'll do the Rajya Sabha and the Councils together because they're similar. Now, the Lok Sabha can't be abolished. The parliament cannot wake up one day and say we are going to abolish the institution of Lok Sabha entirely. Because parliamentary democracy is basic structure. So if you abolish the Lok Sabha, you are actually violating basic structure. And the judiciary, because of the case on the Bharti judgment, is empowered to strike that move of law down. On the other hand, the parliament has the powers and singularly the parliament has the powers for alteration of states. We've done this in our earlier lectures where let us say you are converting a state into a union territory and the only state to have been converted into a union territory in the history of this country is Jammu and Kashmir. In fact, was converted into two union territories, one with legislatures and one without legislatures. So in that way, a state legislative assembly can actually be abolished. If you convert an entire state into a union territory without a legislature, you are technically abolishing the state legislature. So can a state legislature be abolished because of, or because of territorial changes? That is technically possible, right? Now, let's look at Rajya Sabha and Councils. Rajya Sabha, again, is an important ingredient of the parliamentary form of democracy and also federalism because it represents the will of the states. So Rajya Sabha also can't be abolished. There can be a larger debate on the utility of the Rajya Sabha. There can be a larger debate on whether the Rajya Sabha is doing the job for which it was set out to be. If you read the Constituent Assembly debates, which looked at a, a, a preliminary discussion on whether a Rajya Sabha should exist or not, should India have a bicameral system or not, there were members of the Constituent Assembly who did object to the idea of a second house. But now that it has been created, it cannot be abolished. On the other hand, the state legislative councils only exist in a select few states. The last state, the newest state to have a state legislative council for that matter is Telangana because Andhra Pradesh from where Telangana was bifurcated from also had a state legislative council. So Andhra Pradesh has a legislative council and of course Telangana also does have a legislative council. Now let's understand this. 
a legislative council is a second body of deliberation which is being created at the level of the states. Which means you are now going to have another house who is going to discuss the same legislative proposals as the first house. Now the Lok Sabha doesn't have a choice. It has to deal with the existence of the Rajya Sabha. But here the legislative assemblies do have a choice. It's a beautiful application of rule number two, center stronger than the states and the states are given a hollow appeasement or a candy. How is the center stronger than the states? A state legislative council can only and only be created by the parliament through a law. And such a law created by the parliament will not be meant or will not be understood to be a constitutional amendment under Article 368. But the parliament can only look at creating a state legislative council if and only if the legislative assembly of that state is requesting the parliament to do so. There comes the candy. Now how is this a hollow candy? It's a hollow candy because just because the state legislative assembly has requested the parliament that we want a second house, we really want to discuss, deliberate and have the best possible uh, consensus does not mean the parliament is bound to listen to the advice or the request which is given by state legislative councils, by the state legislative assemblies. Just because the legislative assembly of a state has requested the parliament that we want a second house called the state legislative assembly, a uh, state legislative council, it does not mean that the parliament is bound by the request made by the state legislative assembly asking for a state legislative council. And how is that request made? The request is made when the state legislative assembly passes a resolution using special majority two, which is more than two thirds of present and voting simply uh, in such a way that it is more than half of the total strength of the house. In my first odd lectures, I may have mistakenly mentioned it as special majority one, but it is special majority two uh, under clear provisions of the constitution. Now, this is your status. This is the existential status of the four houses. Let's move to the composition. Through a recent constitutional amendment, we do not have nominated members in the lower houses. Now this amendment has been applied prospectively, which means from the date of this constitutional amendment, you shall no longer have nominated members. So for example, when we recently had the, let's say, uh, the UP elections, when we recently have the West Bengal elections, in the UP Legislative Assembly and the West Bengal Legislative Assembly, you shall not have nominated members at all. You previously used to, the grounds were Anglo-Indians, the Lok Sabha had two nominations for Anglo-Indians, whereas the state legislative assemblies had one nomination for an Anglo-Indian. So, as far as the Lok Sabha and the assembly is concerned, it only comprises of elected members, there are no nominated members now onwards. Whereas, because the second houses are supposed to provide a heightened form of deliberation, which can only be possible if they are inclusive. Because just because you won an election does not necessarily make you an apt representative. And what if you're not competent enough to, to win an election because that takes a separate set of skills, but you representing a certain section is equally important. Which is why the idea of nominations exist in the Rajya Sabha and the Legislative Council, the respective second houses. Now, both the Rajya Sabha and the State Legislative Councils have elected 
as well as nominated members. Now the criteria for the Rajya Sabha is literature, arts, science and social service. The abbreviation is LAS. Literature, arts, science and social service. Now you and I are in a digital classroom. We are in a digital class. You just have to add C before LAS. It becomes class. So cooperative societies, literature, arts, science and social service. Now why is cooperative societies a nomination criteria for the councils and not the Rajya Sabha? Because cooperative societies is in the state list and the legislative councils are state representative bodies which is why it is a nomination criteria for the state second house and not the central second house. And as far as nominations are concerned, they are made by the president on the advice of the council of ministers for the Rajya Sabha. They are made by the governor on the advice of the council of ministers of the respective state and only for those states which have state legislative councils. So the composition is fairly clear. Now let's come to the process of election. The Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies have a very simple and a very similar election process. Both follow what is called first past the post system. Now in first past the post system, you simply need to get more votes than everybody else to win. It does not mean that you need to get the most amount of votes. So if there are 10 votes that have been cast, candidate A has 4 votes, candidate three has, uh, B has 3 votes, candidate C has 2 votes and candidate D has 1 vote. This is how the 10 votes have been distributed. Right? Candidate A in a first past the post system will be declared a winner. Of course, there are problems with this process because candidate A still only represents 40% of the vote share. 60% of the people still don't want candidate A. That's okay. That's fine. But by the first path past the post system, this is your basic methodology. Now, in your mains, we will discuss election reforms. We will discuss the recommendations made by the ECI, the Law Commission and so on and so forth on how this could be made better. But as far as the prelims is concerned, this is more than enough. And this is done through a process of a direct election, which means you and I as ordinary citizens above the age of 18 exercise our right of universal adult suffrage, our constitutional right to vote, and we choose our Lok Sabha MPs and our state MLAs uh, collectively, right? Now, we directly go cast a vote on a constituency basis, right? The ordinary tenure is we do this every five years unless there are some extraordinary circumstances, right? Now, uh, there is something called a maximum strength and a current strength. Uh, the prelims exam will never dare to ask you all of this because this is beneath the dignity and the stature of the UPSC civil services exam. The maximum strength at the moment at the Lok Sabha is about 550. Uh, the current strength is about 543 because you've removed our two nominations. So you've got about 543 elected members of the Lok Sabha spread across constituencies throughout the country and we will discuss that in the next uh, segment and that's how it is done. However, there is no fixed strength of the Legislative Assembly, a simple application of rule number two. The strength of the Legislative Assembly is actually determined by the Parliament. You have a range of minimum 60 MLAs to a maximum of 500. Now, of course, there can be exceptions to this rule, wherein smaller states such as Sikkim would have lesser MLAs and that's all right. You don't have to get into the technical details around it. But what you must understand is that the parliament gets to decide the strength of the, looks of the legislative assemblies, a simple application of rule number two. Now comes the slightly complicated part. The prelims will not ask you the formula of a Rajya Sabha election, but you must understand the key terms. The first part is, a Rajya Sabha election and a state legislative council election are conducted in two completely different ways. 
they're not the same, they're not versions of each other, as opposed to a Lok Sabha or a Legislative Assembly. Now, in a Rajya Sabha, the method of election is an indirect election, which means you and I as citizens have chosen somebody and that representative is going to choose somebody else. Now, we understand that the Rajya Sabha is a representative of the state. It's a reflection of state will, which means who have we chosen from a state perspective? We've chosen our MLAs. So our MLAs are going to elect members of the Rajya Sabha. Now, we understand that every state has a certain number of seats for that state at the Rajya Sabha, which means states with higher populations will always have more seats to the Rajya Sabha, thereby proving proportional representation. And of course, the method of election has a single transferable vote. We'll come to that. Now, how does this work is, suppose for example, UP has, these are not real figures, let us say UP has 10 seats in the Rajya Sabha, but only two seats are falling vacant. There will be elections to those two seats. Where will the elections be held? The elections will be held at the UP Legislative Assembly. Who's going to conduct all of these elections? The Election Commission of India, right? So, elected UP MLAs are going to further elect Rajya Sabha MPs from UP for the seats that are vacant for UP. This does not mean that the Rajya Sabha MPs from UP are going to be chosen only from the MLAs. They are going to be chosen by the MLAs. It could be anybody, that's fine, but it will not be from the MLA, it will not be within the MLAs, it will be by the MLAs. That's the basic understanding. Can an MLA fight a Rajya Sabha MP election? Yes. If you win, then you have to choose between the two seats. That's okay. But at no point of time does it compulsorily mean that the Rajya Sabha MP from a state must necessarily be chosen from amongst the existing MLAs of that state. That's not the case. That can never be the case. Because what you're essentially doing is that you're creating an eligibility criteria for a democratic house for you to be prior elected. That's the difference. It would violate a democratic mandate. The basic formula is the total number of MLAs into 100 upon vacancies plus one, close parenthesis or close brackets plus one. So for example, let us say uh, UP has say uh, 100 seats. So 100 into 100 upon, let us say, there are two vacancies. So 2 plus 1 plus 1. This is the minimum number of vote that is required. Each first preference vote has a value of 100. In case this minimum vote is not reached by a single candidate, then the second preference get, gets added like how we did it in a presidential election. That is how it is done. Right? The basic understanding here is, unlike the Lok Sabha and the Legislative Assemblies, which ordinarily have a duration of five years, Rajya Sabha is a permanent house. What does that mean? It means that at one given point of time, the entire MPs of Rajya Sabha do not get replaced at the same time. They get replaced in batches over a longer period of time. That's what makes the Rajya Sabha a permanent house. At no point of time, the entire strength of the Rajya Sabha is going to be replaced all at once. Which means, one third of the members of the Rajya Sabha retire every two years. So the ordinary tenure of a Rajya Sabha MP then becomes six years. Again, rule number four, intra checks and balances that's one more year than the usual electoral cycle of the lok sabha which is five years 
and therefore in an in an order of six six years your your roll call keeps coming and there are vacancies and that is how you conduct your elections this is how rajya sabha elections are conducted you can remove the 100 out of it and then remove the 100 vote value which is again the same thing it's basically total mlas into 100 upon vacancies plus 1 full bracket plus 1 that's the bare minimum number of votes and each vote carries a 100 value that is why you multiplied it by 100 that's it nothing else that's how you calculate this is how the rajya sabha elections are conducted for the prelims all you need to know is indirect proportional representation and single transferable vote and the fact that it is a permanent body the maximum strength at the moment is 250 this has been fixed for now the current strength is 245 and Rajya Sabha as I said before has elected and nominated members we've done this math in a presidential election in lecture 6.1 we've got 233 elected members from different uh, parts of the country and we've got 12 nominated members on the grounds of literature arts science and social service of course there is a lot of debate there are a lot of issues there are a lot of interesting case studies as to how Sachin Tendulkar gets to become a Rajya Sabha MP and so on and so forth but entirely irrelevant as far as the prelims is concerned now that this is clear now that we understand this remember you've been hearing about something called central vista right the number of seats to the Lok Sabha and also for that matter to the Rajya Sabha have been fixed as per the 1971 census now this is due to be revised and it is most likely assumed that we are going to take 2011 census as the base not 2021 census because it hasn't happened due to the pandemic when we take the changes in population of 2011 into account we're expecting a phenomenal increase in the total seat value at least double and our current parliament does not have the infrastructural capacity to host a thousand Lok Sabha MPs which is also perhaps why is a technical reason as to why you require a bigger parliament now there are of course arguments on both sides and we're not getting into it because the prelims is not going to ask you that nor would the mains very honestly in the interview this could be a possible question but this is all that you need to know this is the a technical logistical reason as to why Central Vista may quote unquote be justified now let us look at the state legislative councils the first point of understanding here is if the strength of the legislative assemblies is not fixed there is no way the strength of the legislative council could be fixed so the and the interesting part is the strength of the legislative council is actually dependent on the strength of the legislative assembly which is actually fixed by the parliament therefore rule number two center stronger than the states the minimum is about 40 the maximum strength could be one third of the state legislative assembly however here the strength of the Rajya Sabha is approximately half the strength of the Lok Sabha Lok Sabha will always is approximately double the size of the Rajya Sabha which is also why you will notice when we discuss parliamentary committees any parliamentary committee which has members of both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha you will always see members of the Lok Sabha are double in number than the Rajya Sabha because it reflects the numbers uh, accordingly so first things first the Rajya Sabha is half the strength of the Lok Sabha still strength enough whereas the maximum strength of the council is one third of that of the legislative assembly thereby further diluting the position of the second house as compared to the Rajya Sabha now similar to the Rajya Sabha the state legislative councils also are indirectly elected which means there's an electoral college and we as, as citizens are not going to directly participate there are going to be people who are therefore then going to participate in the further election of the of the state legislative councils now if the basic CSAT if the total composition is one then one third one third one twelfth one twelfth and one sixth if you add all of this it becomes one 
So one third of the legislative council members are chosen by the MLAs, are chosen by the elected MLAs. They cannot be existing MLAs. MLAs cannot fight an MLC election. Very clear on this. MLAs cannot fight an MLC election. You'll have to resign and then contest, but you can't fight simultaneously because otherwise you will fail the purpose of a legislative council and it will simply become a, a, a safe house or a retirement house if you know that your party is going to lose the next general election at the level of the states. So one third of the members are chosen by elected MLAs. They're not from the MLAs. Another one third are chosen by the local bodies, different sorts, rural, urban, both. Another one twelfth are chosen by teachers who've been teaching at least till class 10th uh, for the last three years. So that's basically TGT for the last three years. Another one twelfth are chosen by graduates who graduated at least three years ago. And another one sixth are nominated, which is CLASS. Very interestingly, in the country like ours, and it's, it's the, 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 the contradictions of a country are as beautiful as its hypocrisies, we have qualifications not for the people who are contesting the election, but we have qualifications for the people who are voting in the election. So a teacher or a graduate may vote for an MLC who may have never gone to school. And that's the irony behind it, right? Like the Rajya Sabha, this is also a permanent house and one third of the members retire every two years. This is again sort of irrelevant and beneath UPSC's dignity and we've discussed this in our previous lecture also. As far as ages are concerned, 25 and 25 for legislative assemblies and 30 and 30 for councils. We've discussed why this is a five year age gap because the, the five years represents that you have seen five more years of a government into action. You may not have necessarily been a part of it, right? So this is your process. This is how it is done. Now let's look at residency. There have, there have been some changes for reasons which may or may not be political. Let me not get into those for the want of brevity. If you're contesting a Lok Sabha election and you're obviously contesting to be a part of the central legislature, you're going to be a part of a house of the parliament, which is your national deliberation and lawmaking body. You don't have to be a resident of the state of the constituency that you're fighting from. There are no residency requirements. There used to be residency requirements for the Rajya Sabha, but they're not anymore post the UPA regime because that's how our ex Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh became a Rajya Sabha MP from Assam. Uh, as far as assemblies and councils are concerned, yes, there are residency requirements. You have to be from the state. You have to be a resident of the state if you're contesting uh, an MLA or an MLC election because rule number one, democratic mandate. If you're supposed to be representing the interests of the state, the least you should do is at least be living in that state for long enough. This does not mean that you have to be a domicile of the state. It simply means that you have to be a resident of the state long enough, right? Now, you don't have to get into the technical details here. This is more than enough. And as far as representation is concerned, the Lok Sabha, the constituencies of the Lok Sabha represent all states and all union territories with and without legislatures because the Lok Sabha is your national law making body and the laws made by the Lok Sabha are nationally applicable. As far as the Rajya Sabha is concerned, it is a representation of state will, which means every state which has a representation should also have a representation at the Rajya Sabha. So who has representations? States, states do and union territories with legislative assemblies also do. So Delhi, Pondicherry, JNK and all the other 28 states will have Rajya Sabha seats. However, as far as your regional legislatures are concerned, state legislative assemblies and councils, they're essentially representations within the state and we've got nothing to worry about on that front. So this is your broad comparative understanding. The basic difference here is 
except for financial matters except for legislative powers with respect to financial matters very specifically with respect to money bills the lok sabha and the rajya sabha have absolutely equal powers absolutely equal on the other hand the state legislative assemblies have overriding powers over the councils for all kinds of legislations the lok sabha has overriding powers over the rajya sabha only for money bills the assemblies have it for all kinds of uh, uh, bills which is why joint sittings will be a possibility in the central legislatures will never be a possibility in the state legislatures a in most of the states you don't even have a second house but in the few states that you do you don't need it because the assembly can override the council anyway so this is your general understanding now when we look at it di diagrammatically and let's say we have to visualize how constituencies look every state has two kinds of divisions one is a representative division and the other is an administrative division an administrative division is showcased with green ink which is a district let's say this is a state called state x we'll call it amoeba pradesh because it looks like the amoeba forgive me for my humor it's 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 going worse on a day to day basis so this is district 1 district 2 district 3 let us assume state x has three districts and these districts get further divided administratively into uh, subdivisions subdivisions get further divided into blocks blocks get further divided into tehsils and so on and so forth but those are your administrative divisions as far as your representative divisions are concerned the two basic divisions are a state will have x number of mp constituencies and y number of mla constituencies we will always make sure that an mp constituency is never shared between two states this is our way of giving a hollow candy to the states because the states have absolutely no role in this process the elections to the lok sabha are conducted by the election commission of india which is a centrally appointed authority the states have no role in choosing the body who conducts the lok sabha elections the least we can do the least we can do is at least organize our constituencies on a state by state basis so that there is some brevity and there is some fairness that is why you will never see mp constituencies shared between two states right you will also have mla constituencies but they are only for that specific state and these are representative divisions only for the central and the state legislatures districts can further be divided into local representative divisions wherein you'll have rural self government and urban self government where villages are going to have gram sabhas blocks are going to have panchayat samitis districts are going to have uh, uh, zila parishads urban you will have wards and you will also have either a municipality or municipal council or a municipal corporation so you can only imagine how complex and how much of a web this entire process is and you're here as the collector as the sub collector as a subdivisional collector right in the middle of all of this so one can only imagine how difficult your job is but the basic principle here is that as far as mp constituencies are concerned you will always want it to be fairly divided it would be unfair that one mp is representing 1 lakh people and the other mp is representing just about 100 people because that would be unfair the mp will not be able to do justice the local area development funds will obviously therefore be inconsistent so we try to draw our constituencies in such a manner that you approximately have similar populations in each constituency now statistically it's also very difficult to do which is why your eci rules permit for a variation of about 15% and whenever because of development uh, interstate or intrastate migration when we see density of population changes we always like to redraw our constituencies and that is done through a delimitation commission whose orders 
can never be challenged in a court of law because of rule number three, separation of powers. If we can't get into the collegium process, they can't get into how we are redrawing our constituencies. We haven't even conducted the elections yet. Once elections are conducted, you have a problem with the outcome of the election, come to the High Court, you have a problem with the management of an election, go to the Election Commission of India and that's how it largely works. And the general conclusions here is, the general conclusion here is, more the population of, 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 of an area, smaller will be the size of the constituency. Like for example, in Delhi, the Chani Chowk constituency is incredibly small because of the density of that area, right? On the other hand, larger the population, you will see more number of constituencies because you'll obviously need to have more. So that's the basic principle. You don't need to do anything more than this. There is a 1 is to 10 principle which has to be uniform throughout the country and all that. But don't worry about it. You don't have to get into the technical details here. But this is largely how it is done, right? Now, let's uh, move to the next part. Now that we're talking about how MPs get elected, how students have taken an admission in a school. Now you would remember, and, and most of our schools were largely infamous for this, there were different stages of disciplinary action that a school would take against you. If you were eating food in class, then the school administration might just send you home. But if you were eating the entire class's food that I often was accused of doing, you would be sent home for a longer period of time. But what if you committed a crime in school? Then you may be expelled from school, right? So the different degrees of punishments for our legislatures are essentially of two kinds. One, you suspend them. You can ask them to not be present, you can give them a fine, you can send them to jail, you can suspend them, give them a fine and also send them to jail. You could pick any such combination, that's all right. This is one stage. You're not, you're not kicking them out of their jobs. You're not expelling them, you're not disqualifying them. They still continue to be MPs or MLAs, just that temporarily they can't come to the house, right? The big problem here, the tough action here, is when you're removed, when you're disqualified. Now, thankfully, the provisions and the punishments and the processes for our MPs and MLAs are exactly the same. In some cases, the president takes a call with respect to MPs, logically, and the governor will take a call with respect to MLAs, logically. But the criteria the grounds are exactly the same for our MPs and our MLAs. Whether they're elected, whether they're nominated, whether they're a party MP, whether they're an independent MP or an MLA, doesn't matter. Everybody is treated the same. Now, let's talk about suspensions, fines or jails. We've got something called a privilege or a breach of privilege. You see, Privilege, contempt, defamation are three dimensions of the same entity. You're basically disrespecting what you're a part of, right? Now, the privilege of the parliament as a whole and certain privileges that you have because you're a part of it. There are certain immunities that you have, right? Now, the basic understanding here is that you have been given certain immunities, they're mentioned in the, the, the broad ideas are mentioned, but specific privileges are not defined anywhere in the constitution. We follow British uh, parliamentary conventions, right? Uh, similar for central and state MP, uh, legislators, MPs and MLAs. So you're not defined. There are some basic principles like, for example, your MPs and MLAs have the absolute freedom to, to vote how they want to, and, and, and speak how they want to, but in the zest of voting and speaking, if you break the chairs that you're sitting on, that's a breach of privilege, right? So that's the, that's the, thin, uh, the thin line. 
basically a breach of privilege is crossing the line of immunity it's basically doing something that is disrespecting or 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 denigrating the institution of the parliament or the office that you hold now what constitutes a breach of privilege per se is specifically not mentioned what are your immunities they are definitely mentioned like for example you have immunities from arrest uh, before during and after a session uh, you also have uh, the freedom to vote and speak all of that is there now because this is in the house so intra separation of powers rule number 3 all of this is happening in the house and who is the head of affairs in the house the presiding officer so the presiding officer will therefore decide whether a breach of privilege has happened or not but usually the the norm is you will refer it to the privileges committee of that house based on their recommendations will you decide this is more than enough as far as the pre is concerned although in the last 10 years there hasn't been a question from here now disqualifications there have been several questions specifically on the third front there is a simple logical way to go about it disqualifications of our mps and mlas are mentioned in three different parts first in the core text of the constitution second in an ordinary law which the constitution allows to be created called the representation of people's act and third in the tenth schedule of the constitution right for mps the president decides for mlas the governor decides in some cases we're going to come to that in just a bit the core text of the constitution has some very basic broad provisions that you're no longer a citizen you're on, you're of somebody who's of an unsound mind you're financially insolvent you may be holding an office of profit and what is an office of profit is not defined anywhere it simply means you have a competing office of profit the problem is most of us have a negative connotation to office of profit see an office of profit basically means that you are doing a job for something in return as bureaucrats what you get in return is your salary as mps and mlas what you get in return is your salary the problem is when it conflicts with something else office of profit per se is not a problem conflicting offices of profit is a problem there are exemptions those exemptions are usually mentioned with those provisions for example the vice president of india is also the chairperson of the rajya sabha you're holding two offices uh, exempted under office of profit no problem an mp uh, you have to be an mp and also a minister not an office of profit problem exempted from the office of profit clause so if you're holding an office of profit which is not defined on a case to case basis there are exemptions and provisions laid out then you could be disqualified this is under the core text if i remember I remember my articles correctly it's article 101 102 for mps 190 and 191 for your mlas i am purposely not giving you article numbers largely because you will never be asked article numbers in the prelims exam especially from this topic to a very limited extent from fundamental rights but definitely not from here now as far as representation of people's act is concerned there's a host of things there's a lot of supreme court jurisprudence from lily thomas's case defining or changing the eligibility of 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 of, of a court declaring you guilty and all of that but the broad provisions are that suppose there's a conflict of interest uh, with a relative where you've awarded some favoritism contracts uh, if you've committed an electoral offense if for example there is a criminal offense that has been committed by you you don't have to memorize them at all extremely important as a topic for the mains extremely diametrically irrelevant as far as the pre is concerned now in both of these cases if you notice whether somebody is of an unsound mind or financially insolvent or holding an office of profit or has committed a criminal offense it may also happen outside the house now if it is happening outside the house then the speaker has no value you can't ask the legislature to vote because why will they want to vote to remove one of their own you can't ask the executive because the executive essentially owes its origin to the legislature you can't ask the judiciary right here because it will be a violation of separation of powers so the only a political person for mps is the president and for mlas to a limited extent is your governor 
Now, of course, to assist them, you will require binding advice of the Election Commission of India, who, by the constitution, has been protected with the security of tenure and functional independence so that they could recommend in, a, in an unbiased and an impartial manner. The advice is binding. When they actually issue the removal orders is up to them. There is no time limit on that front. As far as the 10th schedule is concerned, which is popularly called anti-defection, which was added to the constitution later through the 52nd amendment of 1985. Here, there are basic provisions. If an MP or an MLA votes against the direction of the party on whose ticket they had won, if they are acting in any other way which is against the directions of the party, if an independent MP or an MLA is joining any party, that means you are violating democratic mandate. When an independent MP joins a party at any given point, point of time, you are basically violating the trust of your constituency who got you into power because you said that you are not going to be a part of any party. Your political ideology was the fact that you did not have a conformist political ideology. So when you do that, you break the trust, so you should be reprimanded for it. A nominated member joining a political party after six months. Now you must understand the difference here. A nominated MP or an MLA has been nominated primarily because of their expertise in certain fields, because of their representation value. They haven't been given the opportunity to express their political association, which is their fundamental right. But nothing is absolute. This does not mean that their, their right to express their political association should not be misconstrued as political opportunism. So this does not mean that they can keep riding waves of political parties here or there depending on a matter of convenience. Which is why you get six months to decide. Take your pick. You have the time. Within six months, you get to decide. You don't have to necessarily join a party. But if you have to, you've got six months. And you are absolutely free to join a political party, which is different from the Council of Ministers political party, who recommended the president for you to actually become a nominated MP, MP or an MLA in the first place, in, uh, obviously respectively with the governor. Now, the 91st Constitutional Amendment of 2003 had very important recommendations. First, it is not going to be defection if two-thirds of political party A agree which means two-thirds of the members of political party A who are elected have decided to merge with political party B. In that case, it's perfectly valid. And the remainder one-third can function as a separate group. They cannot join any other political party. They cannot go and, 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 and latch on to somebody else. That's not allowed. So that's something which was clarified through the 91st Amendment 2003. And the other thing that was done through the 91st Amendment 2003 is that if you've been disqualified as an MP, you also will have to be removed as a minister if you were one. And the third thing is it also imposes limits on the quantum of council of ministers because defection usually happens from the opposition to the government for political opportunism. Right Now, all of this voting against the party, acting against the directions of the party, an independent person joining a a party or a nominated MP or an MLA joining a party, any of these cases, any of these cases, all of them are largely affecting the political majority within the house. They're largely impacting the, the work within the house and who's the boss within the house, the presiding officer, which is why the presiding officer decides. Once decisions have been made, these are all quasi-judicial decisions. These are all decisions whether somebody is, is violating any of these criteria. Once all of this is done, you can of course file uh, a case in the Supreme Court or the High Court depending on certain circumstances and you're completely free to do so because you have the right to recourse. Otherwise, it will violate the uh, principles of natural justice. So this largely takes care of your disqualifications. Please don't do anything in more detail as far as anti-defection law is concerned. I usually get a question from students saying that, sir, what if uh, the, it is the speaker who's, conduct, who, who's accused of defection? Then the anti-defection law is fairly clear that the house will choose somebody else to conduct the proceedings against the speaker if the speaker has been charged with uh, anti-defection, right? Now, Let's come to the presiding officers. 
This is extremely simple. All presiding officers, except the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha, who is the vice president of India. Now let's understand this. The vice president of India is the ex officio chairperson of the Rajya Sabha. Because you are the vice president, you also happen to be the Rajya Sabha chairperson. It's not the other way around. Because you are the collector of a district, you are also the head of the district disaster management committee. Just because you are the head of the district disaster management committee does not necessarily make you the collector. Otherwise, most of you would aspire to become the head of the district disaster management committee and not the collector because that would sort of be an easier route to get to. Right? Now, all presiding officers except the vice president of India because the vice president of India is the second citizen of the country right after the president. They're all members of the respective houses. If you don't, then you don't have rule number one, the democratic mandate to govern. All of them are elected through a simple majority and all of them are removed through an effective majority, which is more than 50% of the effective strength. Effective strength is the total strength minus death, disqualified and resigned. Why do you use effective majority? Because if you have a problem with the presiding officer, that means you must be a legitimate member of the house. So if I had taken total strength as the base, it would be unfair because you would require a larger number to remove them. And if somebody is dead, disqualified or resigned, then they're obviously not competent enough to see whether these guys were doing a good job or not. And if we kept present and voting simple majority, it would be too less. Because what if a person is not there on the floor of the house today and in the absence of that person, you've removed the chairperson altogether, right? Now, whether the presiding officer is from the ruling party or not, this is all a matter of convention. The constitution is completely silent on this. You've got the speaker and the deputy speaker in the Lok Sabha and the assemblies. You've got the chairperson and the deputy chairperson or the chairperson and the vice chairperson in the Rajya Sabha and the legislative councils, right? Now, uh, as far as seniority is concerned, they're all equal. Uh, the Lok Sabha speaker and deputy speaker are not subordinates. The, they, they, they don't have a hierarchical position. In the absence of the speaker, does the deputy speaker take over? It's that simple, right? They're also assisted by uh, an, a, a permanent executive because they can't run the houses on their own. You require an administrative arm to support you which is why each house has a Lok Sabha Secretariat, a Rajya Sabha Secretariat, which is headed by the Secretary General, who's the topmost uh, administrative head of the Lok Sabha, who has an equal rank as that of the Cabinet Secretary, but given the nature of the houses, is a fairly, fairly uh, subdued office and is, of course, not seen in a lot of public interactions, right? Now, we come to this part. So when we say that the Rajya Sabha chairperson is basically the vice president of India, so whoever is the vice president of India is the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha, which basically means when you're electing the vice president, you're also electing the Rajya Sabha chairperson. When you're removing the Rajya Sabha chairperson, you're also impeaching the vice president of India. They're exactly the same thing. It does not mean that if I remove the Rajya Sabha chairperson, that person continues to be the vice president. No. If you are removing the chairperson of the Rajya Sabha, you are effectively removing the vice president of India because this is what their primary and preliminary jobs are. Not a member of the Rajya Sabha because if the Rajya Sabha is a representative of the states. For you to be a member of the Rajya Sabha, you should have been chosen by the representative of the states. And if all the states were coming together and choosing you, it would breach the norms of parliamentary democracy. So, you are elected by both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha and both elected and nominated members participate. Now, you would have a question. If both elected and nominated members are participating and nominated members don't have a democratic mandate, this seems to be a violation of rule number one democratic mandate. It is actually not because you are effectively choosing the Rajya Sabha chairperson whose primary job is to regulate and keep the house in order. And both elected and nominated members have equal powers on the floor of the house. And if they have equal powers on the floor of the house, then they should participate in the election of the vice president. 
as far as the removal is concerned, here is where Rajya Sabha takes a slight amount of edge. The removal of the Vice President must begin from the Rajya Sabha and you would require the same effective majority here. And the Lok Sabha plays a supportive role. Once the Rajya Sabha has passed the impeachment through an effective majority, the same motion has to be passed through a simple majority in the Lok Sabha. That's all. That's, that's enough. The basic difference here is, if you compare it to the US vice presidential system, in the US, once the pre if, let, let us say, for some unfortunate reasons, the president of the US dies, that the vice president remains the president for the remainder time. But in India, the vice president is only the officiating or the acting president until you have a new presidential election, which is immediate so that you can have the person back in order because the mandate or the depth of election of the president versus the vice president are diametrically apart. All right. Now, let's look at the broad procedures of the houses and let's understand them through the right amount of detail. Right now. We are going to primarily be understanding it for all the central and the state legislatures. This is fairly simple, right? So, we'll go from broad to narrow and then we'll of course start making the small little changes, right? So, the first is the ordinary term or tenure. Now, the ordinary term or tenure for the Lok Sabha or the state legislative assemblies, this is for lower houses only, is five years, ordinarily. Of course, there could be a premature end for no confidence motions or, or anything else. But ordinarily, in ordinary circumstances, you have five years, which is year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, right? Each of these years, we usually follow a financial calendar year. Each of these years have three sessions. The budget session, the monsoon session and the winter session, the BMW session. Mostly new governments begin around monsoon session. Each session has sittings. So sittings is what happens on a specific date. The date of a specific session. So let us say budget session of the 70th, so 70th Lok Sabha, which is basically 2019. 20, 21, 22 and 23, right? So our next elections are going to be in 24, right? So we're currently in 2022. So the budget session of the 17th Lok Sabha in 2022, the date being, let us say, 1st of April 2022. That becomes the sitting. Now what happens on that day? What is happening during the 1st of April 2022 is called an agenda, right? So that's the basic division. Now, this tenure of five years is only for lower houses, whereas session sittings and agendas for all houses, for all states and the center combined. Now, for the central houses, for the Lok Sabha, it is the president. For the state legislative assemblies, it is the governor. Now, by a general convention, the president has something called a joint address to the houses. Your reference books are slightly incomplete on that front. There are actually two kinds of a joint address. Joint address means the president is addressing both the houses together. There are two instances in which this can happen. One is any time the president wants, which is basically on the advice of council of ministers. And the second is the first session of each year and the first session of the first year. So that coincides, right? This is compulsory. This has to happen. This can happen if the president wants. In the history of our country, this has never happened. Never has the president randomly addressed the houses together just because he or she wanted to, right? Now, the address happens together, both the houses sit together, they listen to the Honorable President speak and then in the second part when you're, when you're addressing the houses, this is called motion of thanks. 
where the president is basically reading out the aspirations and the goals and the and the roadmap of the government for the five years and for each year both the houses will then go separate and both the houses will then vote separately if the rajya sabha rejects it does it matter so rajya sabha never rejects it it simply amends it if the lok sabha rejects it then it is trouble it can actually lead to the fall of the government right so that's what is called a joint address now whenever you are ending a tenure which means the lok sabha is coming to an end it is called dissolution and the order of the dissolution can only be issued by the president and if it is a premature dissolution which can happen because of the passage of a no confidence motion or the council of ministers have told the president hum se nahi ho pa raha hai we've lost the majority we think so then if the president issues a dissolution order then it's called dissolution now why does the president do so same reason checks and balances a president is the political authority and therefore will take a decision impartially once an order has been issued it cannot be taken back can it be challenged in a court of law absolutely anything can be challenged in a court of law right now now comes the interesting part you have to decide your parliamentary calendar for the year the parliamentary calendar for the year now firstly india does not have a year round parliament like the canada or australia like canada or australia or the uk also for that matter where the parliament is perpetually in session that's not the case in india in india we have three intervals where the parliament sits or the legislature sit now from what date to what date will they sit this is actually released by the president or the governor respectively and for the president the cabinet committee on parliamentary affairs ref, uh, recommends it to the president similarly you'll have a committee in the states who will recommend it to the governor this is not an independent decision that has been taken in fact it has often been criticized that the, ca- the parliamentary calendar is often set up in such a way that it never coincides with elections in the country so that our honorable members are 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 given free time and and can also campaign to the fullest of their hearts now when you end a, a term or a tenure it's called dissolution when you're ending a session it is called prorogation prorogation has absolutely absolutely zero impact on any bill on any pending legislation the only thing that has an impact on dis- on on legislation is dissolution and i can understand that your standard textbooks are fairly complicated on this because they give you a, a lot of technical details and a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, you know technical understandings but it's very simple after the dissolution of the lok sabha all bills except the bills which are introduced in the rajya sabha and are pending in the rajya sabha if a bill is introduced in the rajya sabha and pending in the rajya sabha it does not lapse every other bill lapses why because of rule number 1 democratic mandate if the mandate is lost then you can't force the new lok sabha to actually conform to the mandate of the previous lok sabha it's actually that simple once the lok sabha is dissolved all bills except those which were introduced in the rajya sabha and are pending in the rajya sabha they are the ones that that are not touched every other bill is automatically lapsed and has to be reintroduced again from the start in the next uh, lok sabha right so prorogation has absolutely no impact on the bills it is simply shutting down of a session now again the prorogation is done by the president or the governor respectively for the same reason rule number 4 checks and balances their apolitical authorities now once this is done we are now in the house now we are saying suppose on the 1st of april 2022 which is let us say a sitting of the budget session of the 17th lok sabha that is the current one that we are in right if you want to end the whole day you just want to end it you want you want half day to be declared right remember how schools often declare half day so half day has to be declared 
and you know suddenly how half days are often declared like for example lot of times schools especially in the pandemic and colleges were shut midway coachings were shut midway right how were they shut you were told either that your school will reopen on next date or the school will inform you when they will reopen next that's exactly how this is it's basically just shutting down of the school if you are shutting down if you are shutting down with a specific date in mind that you are going to be reopening or you are going to uh, reconvene the house on x y z date it's called an adjournment if you are shut if you are shutting down without further notice or until further notice signed i means until further notice then it's called adjournment signed i how this curfew and curfew signed i it's the same thing so this is done who decides it because it's about regulating the conduct of the house as a whole you're shutting the house off the class monitor should decide the house monitor should decide the school principal should decide the presiding officer does now you are discussing what is happening during the day house was supposed to discuss x now you don't want to discuss x you want to discuss something else right you want to change the agenda you want to change the subject matter of discussion anything that that changes the agenda of the house anything which is happening on the floor of the house within that specific day or date will always be suffixed with the word motion and the house will always decide always always decide through a varying majority but all motions necessarily are always passed through simple majority all motions okay so if you are shutting down what is to be discussed and you want to move it to another discussion then you will have to pass an adjournment motion and adjournment motion and 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 adjournment of the sitting are two very very different things right so this is how it largely works clear now very important there are certain restrictive motions which are sort of restraining activity of the house through an adjournment motion you are changing the agenda of the house now in a politically elected house such as the lok sabha with direct political majority there is a political mandate the rajya sabha has no political mandate you want to stop a specific minister from talking or attending the proceedings of the house or you have a question mark whether the party really has majority on the floor of the house or not in all of these three cases you are restricting the mandate of the house by a simple application of rule number 2 center stronger than the states all of these motions at the center will only and only be in the lok sabha and not the rajya sabha because if a no confidence motion could also be passed in the rajya sabha then the states indirectly would have a say in the political stability of the center which is why it is not allowed which is why all of these three motions are necessarily and only and only used in the lok sabha the lower house or even in the states the lower house right finally when we were talking about these budget monsoon monsoon winter sessions nowhere in the constitution does it say that you've got to have three sessions nowhere does it say so the constitution says that the maximum gap between these sessions could be 6 months which is why you will see nominated members uh, cannot join a party after 6 months uh, for example emergency has to be uh, renewed every 6 months a certain kind of it so 6 months plays a very important role because within 6 months the houses have to sit once at least so that is what it is right so so this is your general procedure as to how things work as far as the houses are concerned now now let us see once we understood that this is what happens during the day let's take a magnifying glass and actually understand what happens during a day now this is just indicative because in reality you could have extension of timings as well but ordinarily and now we are taking a magnifying glass and focusing to central legislatures they usually start at 11 o'clock in the morning nice up early nice bright and early at 11 o'clock in the morning 
from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock they've got one session from 12 to 1 they've got another session from 1 to 2 they break for lunch which is at an, which is a lovely lunch subsidized lunch from your and my tax money from 2 p.m. to about 6 p.m. is the general duration the Lok Sabha sits till 6 usually the Rajya Sabha sits, uh, sits till 5 because House of Elders they've got to take their medication faster so maybe that's why but let's understand this so from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. usually, and this is very important I see a lot of you getting into a lot of technical details as to whether this is in the constitution whether it is in the procedures whether this is an Indian innovation and all of those things now understand this when you're looking at what kind of discussions are happening on the floor of the house do you think that the constitution would honestly be that intrinsic enough would be that technically detailed enough because if you did that then you would actually violate the the house itself you would actually violate the individuality of the house you would violate the democratic mandate of the house in most cases the general practice is between 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. you have what is called elocution from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. you have something called extempore so how does this work? Elocution means you've prepared your speech, you've prepared your poem, you've prepared your debate and all of those things. This is called a question hour. Usually it is the MPs, usually the opposition MPs are asking questions to the ministers. Now some questions require a, a verbal answer, they're called starred questions. Some questions require a written answer because they're those kind of questions. So they're called unstart questions. On a daily basis, whenever the house is in session, you'll see about 20 start questions and about 230 unstart questions being replied to. Now, of course, there are technical details as to whether you have a right to follow up on a start question and all of that. Again, not in your syllabus, please don't bother. These questions are submitted to the secretariat well in advance. The secretariat forwards these questions to the respective ministries. You as bureaucrats in the ministries prepare answers for your ministers and the ministers then recite the answers or deliver the answers to the MPs on the floor of the house. Now this is prepared, this is, this is all rehearsed, it is just a healthy discussion. From 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., this is where the house is open, the floor is open, anybody can say anything that they want to. The speaker or the presiding officer will recognize people to speak in turns and of course they can continue to understand whatever it is that they are and then this can go on for an hour it is largely unregulated there are absolutely no uh, there are absolutely no restrictions that is why most amount of poetry a lot of those snide comments a lot of these jokes uh, you know all of that largely happens between 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock the house usually breaks for lunch and the actual legislative business of the house happens in the second half of the houses, right? The second half of the day, right? This is where the legislative business happens. Legislative business is nothing but the passage of proposals, the passage of legislative policies, which are nothing but bills. Now we will understand the types of bills that exist. There are actually three ways to classify bills, three actual ways to classify bills. First is introduction on, on the basis of who is introducing a bill. If a minister is introducing a bill, it is called a government bill. Anybody else, even if it is an MP of the ruling party, it is a private member bill. I often see there is a confusion among students that a private member cannot introduce a constitutional amendment or a private member cannot introduce a money bill. There is technically no restriction whatsoever. Any member can introduce any kind of bill. There's absolutely no restrictions. If a private member is introducing a money bill, a money bill requires a presidential recommendation. So you would eventually go through the government route anyway. But technically a private member can introduce a money bill. A private member has introduced a money bill on several occasions in the past. So that's the basic difference. So what is so special about a government bill? Usually it gets priority to be tabled and discussed on the floor of the house. That's the only major thing. 
Now, in terms of what is inside the bill, what is it that they're trying to do? An original bill is something which contains new ideas. An amending bill is, for example, so an original bill would be, let us say, the code on industrial relations, for that matter. That's an original bill, right? Um, uh, or in fact, uh, an original bill would be, let us say, the Higher Education Commission of India or the National Medical Commission, right? And amending would be a bill to amend an existing law. So, for example, when you are changing the marriageable age of, of women from 18 to 21, you are amending an existing law. Then you have a consolidating law. Multiple laws are being put into one. You are putting it under one major umbrella law, like the code on wages, the code on social security, the labor codes basically. Then you have expiring continuance laws. Sometimes laws have an expiry date. So, if you want the laws to continue beyond their expiry date, then they're called expiring laws. Then a lot of times you want to stop a law from being being uh, enacted or being enforced. You want to repeal that law. That is also possible. Then you have certain things called validating bills. Like for example, in territory you would have noticed uh, claiming, if you're claiming an unknown and unclaimed territory, it requires an executive action. But that executive action also requires a bill to be passed for changes to be made in Schedule 1. So this is a bill to validate an executive action which has a legislative repercussion. Then you have bills to replace ordinances, you've got money and financial bills, you've got constitutional amendment bills. We'll discuss the last three in a fair amount of detail, right? And this is where there's the most amount of complication. In terms of procedure, these are the different kinds. You've got an ordinary bill, you've got a money bill, You've got a financial category A bill, a financial category B bill. You've got a constitutional amendment bill, uh, which are of three types. You've done this before. Ones that require a simple majority, they're not even called constitutional amendment. Ones that do not require state ratifications, one that requires state ratifications, that's under Article 368. And bills that have to be passed within a certain timeline, uh, the ordinance replacement bills. There are different procedures for each of these. The most complex is here because this is where you will see a lot of interchange and a lot of overlap and a lot of subjectivity here. Also at the same time, I must also very clearly tell you that a bill can have a financial nature but can also change the constitution. And if it has a financial nature and is changing the constitution, then you will use the constitutional majority. The second anything is changing the constitution, no matter what kind of a, of, of, of a bill it is, this will override everything else. So that's how. Anyways, ordinances cannot, cannot amend the constitution, so that's, that's out of the picture. I'll give you certain examples also. Like for example, uh, very recently in the current budget session, a constitutional amendment bill has been introduced by a private member to include Article 21B called the right to health in the constitution. This has been proposed, unlikely for it to be passed. And for the right to health to be implemented, the private member has said this will require about a thousand crores to be spent by the government. It is something which has a financial implication, but is ultimately changing the constitution Article 21B will require special majority too, but has a financial nature. So that is also allowed, that's also fine. The ultimate procedure will be this, because if you're passing through a higher majority, you're anyways covering a simple majority here, right? So that is why. Anyways, so now let's look at all of this in a fair amount of detail. When we look at a comparison, we will be looking at the, the following basis. What you must always understand under all circumstances is for a bill to become a law, for a bill to become a law, it has to be passed by both the houses of the parliament. There cannot be any bill, there cannot be any bill which will only be passed by one house. The second house may, may play a, a lesser role. The second house may be overruled by the first house. That's all right. But for a bill to be passed or for a bill to be made a law, it has to be passed by both the houses. A common misconception that I often note among students is students often believe that the Rajya Sabha doesn't vote on the budget. 
द राज्यसभा एब्सल्यूटली वोट्स ऑन द बजट इनफैक्ट द राज्यसभा वोट्स ऑन बोथ द बिल्स ऑफ द बजट द अप्रोप्रिएशन एंड द फाइनेंस बिल वी विल डिस्कस दिस इन द नेक्स्ट लाइफ बट इट डज यू कैनॉट मेक अ लॉ विदाउट बींग पास बाय बोथ द हाउसेज ऑफ द पार्लियामेंट नो मैटर वॉट एंड दैट समथिंग यू मस्ट वेरी क्लियरली अंडरस्टैंड राइट एनी वेज सो let's start with the basic differences of the bills which are of a financial nature that's where the most complications rise ordinary money financial category a financial category b some books call it financial 1 financial 2 some call it financial class 1 class 2 they essentially mean the same thing broadly money financial a and financial b are largely of a financial nature the only difference between them in terms of of what they contain is the degree of money that is being spent the intensity with which the money has is 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 concerned so that's something you must understand so an ordinary bill can be introduced in either of the two houses whereas uh, whereas a money bill can only be introduced in the lok sabha a financial bill a can also only be introduced in the lok sabha whereas a financial bill b can be introduced in either of the two houses no problem at all financial b bill b is fairly close is fairly similar to ordinary in terms of introduction as far as presidential recommendation is concerned the prior recommendation of the president before the introduction of the bill this is always before the introduction of the bill on the floor of the parliament for instance you do not require a presidential recommendation for an ordinary bill you most certainly require a presidential recommendation for a money bill because of rule number 2 center stronger than the states the rajya sabha is anyways going to play an, a, a a diminished role the president therefore will use wisdom to make sure that the bill is appropriate and right because both the center and the states have collectively elected the president in the highest format of election possible to this country then you have financial a in which a presidential recommendation is needed but if it is about a reduction in tax then you don't need it because you already got a presidential recommendation for introducing the tax in the first place right and then you have financial b where yes you need it but the president can recommend it to be introduced in either of the two houses here only and only in the lok sabha so that's the basic difference in financial a presidential recommendation for the lok sabha in money bill recommendation for the lok sabha in financial b recommendation for either of the two houses for before voting either of the two houses no problem at all so that's the basic difference as far as the powers of the house is concerned the lok sabha and the rajya sabha have equal powers as far as an ordinary bill is concerned as you would know they have unequal powers as far as the money bill is concerned this is fairly simple the rajya sabha gets 14 days to make a recommendation the rajya sabha cannot reject the bill it has to recommend changes if it is so solemnly disagreeing with the bill but it can't reject it you've got 14 days if you don't give a suggestion in 14 days it is deemed to have been passed by the rajya sabha again an application of rule number 2 financial a they have equal powers financial b they have equal powers so what is really different here is basically presidential recommendation and where can it be introduced that's the basic difference now you must understand what is it all about an ordinary bill is basically an idea that does not require you to spend any money for example the triple talaq law you don't require money to criminalize something right money bill money bill is clearly defined under article 110 clause 1 uh, subjects a sub clause is a to f now uh, you don't have to memorize them in detail at all all you need to know is any increase or decrease in tax anything added or subtracted or the custody of the consolidated fund or the contingency fund of india uh, anything added or subtracted uh, from uh, any increase or decrease to parliamentary borrowing and government guarantees and of course you will require a speaker certificate the speaker certificate is required in two places one is when you are transmitting the bill to the rajya sabha for 14 days and two once it has been passed by both the houses it has been sent to the president for the assent that's again when you require a speaker certificate now broadly this is heavily about spending or 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 making money so fundamentally a majority of this is about the money your the, the primary objective of this is money 
here it is lighter here secondary objective is money and that's actually the difference i'll give you a simple example right now financial a is all of this plus something else and this plus something else is actually fairly important it's the money is a byproduct it's not the primary element and in financial bill b it is basically to do with expenditures and financial bill a is largely to do with taxation i'll give you an example so for example very recently in april 2022 a bill has been proposed called the indian antarctic bill now the indian antarctic bill is basically a financial bill why because the primary objective of this is not the spending of money the primary objective of the indian antarctic bill is to regulate indian expeditions to antarctica because india has ratified an international treaty for the same and also to give grants for expeditions that when you're giving grants it's essentially an expenditure so it's essentially a financial bill b right the primary objective was not money right like for example if you are just increasing the salaries of the supreme court judges the parliament by law has the powers to do so the supreme court judges act of 1958 or 56 the primary objective is spending money it's a money bill but if you are increasing the number of judges the primary objective is increasing the strength of the supreme court and when you are increasing the strength of the supreme court you will also have to pay them salaries and pensions which is chargeable to cfi so it becomes a financial bill b that's the difference in fact very recently there has been a change to supreme court and high court rules a very minor irrelevant change for upsc where they looked at they they've clarified on the calculation of date for pensions that basically is a money bill because you're fundamentally dealing with money right for example in 2021 december uh, we've proposed a bill called the national anti doping bill which is again because india is ratified to an international convention on on regulation of anti doping which is basically to stop the usage of drugs in sports right the primary purpose of this is to set up a national anti doping authority which will require some funds so it's a financial bill b right S- similarly labor codes your codes on industrial security your codes on wages your codes on relations industrial relations these are all financial bills the primary objective is labor well labor welfare and it also has a certain compensation part like for example very recently i think just about 2 3 months ago we've introduced an amendment to crpc that amendment to crpc is 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 and it, it is an amendment uh, which is being proposed by a private member and this amendment and it's a very interesting amendment in criminal law reforms it basically wants to give compensation for wrongful prosecution that if somebody has been wrongly prosecuted by the state then the center or the state government depending on the nature of the case has to compensate the person for wrongly prosecuting it the primary objective is compensation it's a money bill that's the basic difference right clear understood for example the and, and we were discussing this in the in the earlier slide that even if it is a finance it is in the nature of a finance it it is financial in nature but is ultimately changing the constitution so constitutional majorities will apply for example the right to health uh, uh, proposal that i was talking to you about has just been introduced very recently i think in april 2022 by a private member he want to introduce something called 21b it is fundamentally a change to the constitution but to implement right to health which includes right to mental and environmental health you will require an expenditure of 1000 crores as proposed by the mp it's essentially financial in nature but it also changes the constitution so it's actually going to be a constitutional amendment bill for example your online gaming bills your palliative care bills these are all which are proposed legislations of the recent times this is also why ladies and gentlemen they will never ask you the finer differences between financial a and financial b in the exam they have never asked you this do you understand why because the lines are so thin this is why right anyways so the basic process is either the lok sabha or the rajya sabha let us assume it starts from the lok sabha goes to the rajya sabha the president uh, passes it it bec- uh, the president gives an assent it becomes a law now if if it's going from the first house to the second house and it's an ordinary bill 
it's not a money bill right or it's a financial bill a or a financial bill too where both have equal voting powers the second house can either the second house can either reject the bill entirely saying we don't like it this just makes no sense at all two uh, can make an amendment which is not liked by the first house or they make an amendment which is not liked by the second house so there is a there is a complete disagreement on the amendments to the bill or third these guys have not taken any action and it's been 6 months 6 months is where both the houses have to sit again in that case what you reach is called a deadlock now once a deadlock has been reached only and only if the president wishes so and that's on the advice of the council of ministers you can call for a joint sitting and you will require a simple majority of the total members present and voting to pass it why because money bills and constitutional amendment bills cannot have a joint sitting and the speaker of the lok sabha will preside over it and if the speaker is not there then the deputy speaker of the lok sabha will preside but the presiding officer of the rajya sabha the vice president of india will never preside over a joint sitting because you are not a member of the house so you have no business presiding over a joint sitting which has elected members of the lok sabha the temple of 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 democracy at the national level so this is largely how your your basic processes work right so just to give you a quick understanding and a quick revision of it as far as an ordinary bill is concerned can be introduced in either of the two houses moved to the neither of the two houses assented by the president the president is completely free to either accept the bill give the assent reject it entirely or even return it for reconsideration if you return it and it comes back to the president that the president has to necessarily accept it but of course there is no time frame given as you discussed in lecture number 6.1 now we look at money bills money bills have to first begin with a presidential recommendation we have understood why because of an application of rule number 2 they have a national impact but the rajya sabha has a limited role so this is like a compensation mechanism can only and only be introduced in the lok sabha you require a speaker certificate before it reaches the rajya sabha then within 14 days the rajya sabha has to uh, give its suggestions back to the lok sabha if at all if no suggestions it directly goes to the president if suggestions are given lok sabha approves them or rejects them and then through a speaker certificate it reaches the president the president can either say yes or no the president can either accept or reject the president cannot return a money bill and we understand why because if the president is returning the money bill it's effectively coming back here where the lok sabha has an upper hand and the president is bound by the advice of the council of ministers in general cases and if it is coming back to the lok sabha it is still going to come back here because these guys are the ones who are in majority anyway so if the political majority in the lok sabha doesn't want the money bill to pass it would have never passed in the first place that is why it is just redundant for the president to just uh, to return the money bill for reconsideration and there shall no, not be any joint sitting because if there was a joint sitting then the rajya sabha would have powers and it would violate rule number 2 center stronger than the states as far as financial bill a is concerned you require a presidential recommendation can only be introduced in the lok sabha but then also needs to be passed equally by the rajya sabha the president has all choices available similarly with financial bill b presidential recommendation to be introduced in either of the two houses if introduced in the lok sabha goes to the rajya sabha if introduced in the rajya sabha then goes to the lok sabha then passed by the president uh, assented by the president all options are available as far as the constitutional amendment is concerned can be introduced in either of the two houses no presidential recommendation is required because it would undermine the authority of the parliament under 368 the president is absolutely free to either only and only accept a constitutional amendment the president cannot reject it the president cannot return it you just have to say yes in some cases after both the central houses have passed it goes to the states for ratification comes back to the president there is absolutely no role of the governor as you've discussed in lecture 6.1 and there is absolutely no joint sitting whatsoever as far as the constitutional amendment is concerned because if there is a joint sitting then it would unnecessarily be in the favor of the lok sabha because they have more numbers and it would undermine the rajya sabha and therefore would undermine the power of the parliament as a whole to amend the constitution and affect the appeasement that we are giving the states 
in the first place. So this is how it largely works. This is so simple. This is so logical. Just think freely. You will never go wrong with these things, right? Now comes the most overrated part. People spend a lot of time getting into the technical details of how bills are passed. You really, really don't need to. All you need to know is there are basically three readings. What happens inside these three readings is absolutely left to the discretion of the houses. Intra-separation of powers rule number three. But broadly, what usually happens is the bill is introduced by whoever has proposed it. If it's the government, then the minister. Uh, then nowadays, because we have departmentally standing parliamentary committees, which we will discuss in the next slide, it usually gets referred to them. They prepare a report. Then that report is also attached to the bill. And the second reading, the second phase, which is called the second reading begins. It primarily has two stages. First is a general discussion on the bill. And then depending on the nature of the bill, you may sometimes create a select committee of just that house or a committee of both the houses. Then the second stage where you have a clause by clause discussion, amendments are entertained. The third reading happens where that house has a final discussion, votes on the bill, and then it moves to the second house. And then it moves to the second house. And then the second house passes under ordinary conditions, goes to the precedent. It's honestly that simple. Now comes a special kind of a bill called the annual financial statement, also popularly called the budget. Very simply, the budget is nothing but a money bill. It is absolutely nothing but a money bill because if the money bill is about additions or subtractions to Consolidated Fund of India, that's exactly what the budget does. Takes money out of the CFI, gives it to the ministries, gives it to the states, the ministries spend it on the departments and the schemes, the states spend it on the schemes and so on and so forth. It's basically spending money. Now. The basic understanding here is, the basic principle here is introduced by the president only in the Lok Sabha, directly in the Lok Sabha, also introduced in the Rajya Sabha, they also discuss, they also vote, but after voting they give it back to the Rajya Sabha because ultimately it is a money bill, then goes to the president for the assent, right? Now, the budget comprises of two separate bills. One is called an appropriation bill, the second is called a finance bill. An appropriation bill is the money which is being spent. A finance bill is your broad taxation changes, your policy changes, ki hum income tax bada denge, ghata denge, aisa kar denge, aisa kar denge. And of course, with the recent Fiscal Responsibility Budget Management Act, we now have to attach what is called a fiscal policy statement or a budget policy statement uh, along with the budget. Now, an appropriation bill is, is, is like a student living on rent, right? Whether you like it or not, you have to pay rent, no matter how badly does it hurt you. It hurts me, I also live on rent. That is your compulsory expenditure. That cannot be played with. But your miscellaneous expenditure, the amount of money that you spend on food, on recreation, and all those dark activities that you indulge in, that of course is, is something which is open and debatable. Similarly, the appropriation bill has certain expenditures charged to the CFI. They are not voted uh, in the budget, they are decided, they can be discussed, they are pre-decided because these expenditures are necessary for checks and balances and for independent impartial functioning of the democracy. These charges are the president, the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha presiding officers, the salary and the pensions of the Supreme Court judges, only the, only the pensions, sorry, not the salary, only the pensions of High Court judges because the salaries of High Court judges are to the consolidated fund of the states and because, high, because by central law, High Court judges cannot practice in the court in, in the states that they've been High Court judges, which is why their, sal their pensions are taken care of by the central budget and of course the office and the expenses of the CAG, any interest that we have to pay and any money that has to be spent on the implementation of a court order. This is essential for effective functioning of a democracy. Whatever money has to be spent, has to be spent whether you like it or not. This is where the variation lies. This is where the demand for grants are made. This is nothing but the amount of money which is given to ministries and departments. 
the amount is pre-decided. Uh, the, the, the ministries sit with the departmental committees, they sit with the standing committees, they come to a, come to a consensus, they come to a, 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 a good number. These committees comprise of members of both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Therefore, there is a, there's, there's a very sublime way of checks and balances and then you essentially vote on a demand for grant. The finance bill again is nothing but a broad fiscal policy change. This is how it is voted. There has never been a question on the procedure of the budget in the last 10 years. It is my humble request, don't spend more time than needed. This is more than enough for you to get your basics right. Basically, money cannot be spent without the passage of a law. A consolidated fund of India is basically the government's, it's basically the source of money for the, for, for the country as a whole, for the central government. You have a consolidated fund for the states. Contingency fund, which we discussed in the money aspect, in the money bill aspect of it, is basically for a contingency, it's for an emergency. So you take money out of the consolidated fund, put it in the contingency, you want to take money out of it immediately, you take it out, later let the parliament pass a law and authorize it. That's the only difference, nothing else, right? So this is how your budget is, is passed and executed with humble request, don't do anything more than this. Now comes the deadliest but the easiest part, committees. Very simple, very logical, very self-explanatory. There are broadly two kinds of committees, ad hoc committees and standing committees. Ad hoc committees are temporary in nature, which means uh, once their purpose is fulfilled, they are, they are diluted, they are finished. There are two kinds of ad hoc committees, one on the basis of an issue, the second is on the basis of a bill. For example, uh, you can have a temporary committee to examine uh, the role of Facebook in communal riots or elections, specific issue. Or it could be for a specific bill, like for example, the parliamentary committee on the data protection bill or the parliamentary committee on the National Medical Commission, so stuff like that. If it comprises of members of both the houses, it's called a joint ad hoc committee. If it only has members of one house, it's called a select committee. The fun begins here. Standing committees are permanent committees. What does this mean? This means that the composition of these committees may change on a yearly basis. But these committees will always exist. The members will change, but they will always exist. They usually report to the presiding officer or the speaker. Ministers play a negligible role because it will defeat the purpose. The ministers don't usually get a, get a chance to vote. This is all in procedures, which is why it's not in your syllabus. Now, a departmental committee primarily exists to advise the elected executive. This is nothing but rule number four, checks and balances, right? The legislature is advising the executive, whereas the parliamentary standing committees are largely to advise the legislature, which is again rule number four, but intra checks and balances. It is within the legislature, helping the legislature function better. Now, remember the two is to one rule. Lok Sabha has twice the number of members than the Rajya Sabha, which is why you have 21 members in the Lok Sabha and 10 members from the Rajya Sabha, total of 31 who comprise of departmental standing committees. Now, some of these committees are given secretarial support by the Lok Sabha, some are given by the Rajya Sabha because otherwise it will be too burdening on each house. But their primary job is to assist their respective ministries and departments. So departmental standing committee on education, on health, on agriculture, on, on, on industrial relations and so on and so forth. They assist the respective ministries in policy making, in examining bills, in giving other kind of expert advice. As far as parliamentary standing committees are concerned, they primarily exist to advise the legislature, the parliament to function better. So what do they do here? There are essentially three kinds of parliamentary committees. One which only comprise of members of the Lok Sabha, rule number two, center stronger than the states. One which combine, which have members of Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha in the same committee. This is nothing but rule number four, checks and balances. And this is a separate committee for Lok Sabha members and a separate committee for Rajya Sabha members. This is rule number three, separation of powers. And you can very easily understand by the sheer name of the committee. 
so for example estimates committee is supposed to help the government with estimates is basically help the government to come up with numbers that they should propose in their financial bills which means the money has not been spent which means you are basically helping the government draft financial bills or draft money bills if in the actual money bill the rajya sabha plays no role or in neg negligible role how can you have the, the rajya sabha members a part of the estimates committee which is why it only has 30 members from the lok sabha private members will always feel face difficulty in the lok sabha because it's political majority they will never face difficulty in the rajya sabha because rajya sabha does not have the concept of political majority so everybody has ideally and 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 in in an idealistic manner an equal say in the rajya sabha which is why you have a private members committee only comprising of lok sabha members for the lok sabha now when you have to examine the expenditure which has been made by the government right you have the public accounts committee now the money has been spent now checks and balances can apply and the money has to impact center and states both which is why you will have both lok sabha and rajya sabha members in the ratio of 2 is to 1 15 members from the lok sabha seven members approximately from the rajya sabha now if the president had expert advice from eci for election uh, for disqualifications don't you think we can have expert advice from the cag here which is why cag reports are given to the psc for examination and therefore also get tabled in the parliament right similarly public undertaking also similarly women sc and st it doesn't matter which house you are from vulnerable sections for women scheduled caste and scheduled tribes have to collectively be emancipated we have to make sure we have gendered legislation and caste sensitive legislation and practices so you will have members of both the houses to look into this again 2 is to 1 ratio 20 members from the lok sabha and 10 members from the rajya sabha whereas when we look at separate uh, committees for the lok sabha and the rajya sabha you would usually notice say for example the committee on privileges lok sabha has its own privileges rajya sabha has its own privileges committees on petitions business assurances business advisory let them do their own thing uh, library committee library the parliament has one library so we'll have a combined committee of lok sabha and rajya sabha for library committee that's it it's honestly that simple this is all that you really need to know as far as committees are concerned now with this all you need to do is read the chapter on parliament once revise this and you are done my recommendation for the reading list is read the entire chapter on parliament from lakshmi kant it's exactly the same in the 6th and the 6th edition there isn't a ton of difference but do definitely read it read the whole chapter once just do this and your entire topic is over i know this was a long lecture but it needed the attention that it so deserves now our complicated portions are over we have one lecture on judiciary one on center state and local self government and one on bodies i'll upload them within 24 to 48 hours and we'll move to uh, mcqs in the following days itself thank you for watching i'll see you in the next one bye bye